All right, folks, welcome today to uh, All Aboard the CAN Bus or Motorcycle. Two wires, two wheels, bikes can do CAN too. Um, in today's talk, we will um, cover who am I, a little bit about myself, um, the bike and brand. I feel to um, completely understand the essence of this project. Uh, the bike's a little bit on the rarer side, so uh, we'll cover a little bit about that. Uh, why the project inspiration and purpose, uh, some of the hurdles that came into play when um, working with a motorcycle as opposed to a car. And then uh, the project begins, what I used, what I built, the uh, hardware involved uh, with the project. Um, I built an engine simulation and um, I did quite a bit of CSV parsing and data analyzing with a uh, Python script I made. And then we'll talk a little bit about what I, uh, what's the future of the project. So who am I? I'm Derek. I've been riding motorcycles for about 10 years. Um, I've been a uh, developer and infosec hobbyist for about 15 years. I uh, currently work as director of IT for a uh, food and beverage automation company. Um, if you're interested in continuing to follow this project after uh, this talk, you know, you can follow me on Twitter, Canbus Dutch. Um, if you have any questions that aren't answered or you don't get a chance to ask them at the end of the talk, um, you could email me at canbusdutchgmail.com. And um, all the code talked about can be found at uh, my GitHub, github.com slash circuitworks1. So this is my bike, an EBR 1190RX. Um, those of you not familiar with EBR or the Buell brand, um, Eric Buell, the founder, was a uh, Harley engineer who liked racing motorcycles. Um, they make the only, or they, yeah, they're the only production sport bike made and designed in the USA. Uh, they're the only American-made motorcycle to ever score points in World Superbike, and they won the 2009 Daytona Superbike Championship without a single DNF. Those not into power sports, it stands for did not finish, which means uh, no engine failures and, more importantly, no accidents. Uh, they manufactured nearly 140,000 motorcycles uh, in 15 years when acting as a Harley subsidiary. And in 2009, after Harley Davidson axed Buell, they uh, came back as Eric Buell Racing and sold 65 bikes in 18 months, garnering 3 million in revenue as a startup. And sadly, now it's a company teetering on the edge of existence. So here's a few Buells and EBRs, some uh, a face only a mom could love. But uh, that top bike there in the top left is the uh, bike that helped them fund uh, EBR. It's the EBR 1190RS. And then you'll see the same bike I have, the EBR 1190RX. And then the EBR 1190SX, which is the same as uh, the RX, just in a different trim. And then down here, we take a look at uh, the um, Buell XB9S, which utilizes a Harley-Davidson Sportster power plant. And then the EBR XB9R, and then, or sorry, the Buell XB9R. And then finally, the uh, Buell 1125R. And uh, we can't forget that is the uh, 2010 Buell Blast, which is uh, kind of an inside joke amongst the uh, Buell community. So now let's get into it. So after about six months of owning my EBR 1190RX, um, I was on a large group ride where I did about 100 miles in a day. Um, and on my way back home, my dash fell apart. Um, luckily I didn't lose anything. Um, my screen there held on by the, uh, ribbon to the rest of the, uh, display. And, um, when I got back home, I reassembled it, but sadly, uh, I started receiving a, uh, a comm error. And after about a, uh, 
a few months of, um, you know, surfing around the Buell Facebook groups and forums, I started to realize I wasn't the only one. There was this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy. Well, you get the point. Um, so sadly, um, apart from these com errors, there was also individuals who um, had their dash rattle to pieces just as mine did. And um, at the time, the future of EBR was being decided by the courts as they had filed for receivership, which is a similar process to bankruptcy. And there was zero parts availability. So because I'm not only stupid, but also ambitious, I uh, decided to look into designing an aftermarket dash. And that's when I realized it probably wouldn't be as easy as I thought. The main issue I ran into is that uh, there is no diagnostics standard in the motorcycle industry. OBD2 is kind of a large plug, hard to fit on a small vehicle and not really ideal for motorcycles. Um, although we will see the OBD2 standard is used on a few manufacturers. And uh, from what I've been told that uh, it is becoming a standard in, uh, in Europe. So um, there are universal diagnostic tools, although, uh, you know, the um, bite offset, scaling factor, all of that good stuff is different for every manufacturer. And in order for these universal tools to obtain that information, the manufacturers charge a lot of money. So these tools are very expensive. Not only that, but um, the likelihood of finding a universal diagnostics tool that works with uh, a bike with a only about a thousand of them manufactured in the world um, is slim to none. You aren't going to find. So let's take a look at uh, the, um, we'll take a peek into the uh, motorcycle diagnostic support world. Um, in this slide alone, we have two Kawasaki, two Hondas, two Suzuki uh, connectors. And there we go. Um, there we have a uh, four pin Harley diagnostics cable. And we can see there that uh, Piaggio, Triumph and Victory all use the uh, vehicle standard uh, OBD2. And then here we see another Kawasaki connector. And here we have the, uh, the Buell um, diagnostics port. And then we have another Kawasaki cable. And uh, this is one of my favorites. Uh, so this MV Agusta uh, four pin cable down here uh, is actually the same connector used on Hondas, but it has a separate pin out. So if you accidentally use the MV Agusta connector on your Honda, you will fry your ECM. And then here's another one that kind of grabs my attention. Down in the left-hand corner there, we have the Harley-Davidson CAN six-pin cable. If you remember, I just mentioned they had a four-pin diagnostics cable and a six-pin CAN cable. And uh, as we all know, CAN is a uh, two-wire signal. So why couldn't they have just jammed the diagnostics in CAN into one cable? Who knows? And uh, last but not least, we have the uh, Benelli uh, cable there. But overall, that's 37 different connectors for about 25 different manufacturers. Kind of a headache. But luckily, we have CAN. Um, most European and Japanese manufacturers began implementing a, uh, a CAN bus system on their bikes around 2003. This includes Ducati, BMW, Honda, Kawasaki, and uh, the American manufacturers, as with most things when it comes to automotive, were a little bit late to the CAN party. Buell first implemented a CAN system on the 2008 release of their 1125, and um, 
Harley's first cam based bike wasn't until 2011 and uh, it wasn't until 2014 that all Harleys were equipped with CAN bus. Um, information was a little bit lacking when it came to uh, the Polaris brands, Indian and the now defunct Victory, but uh, I believe they started using CAN around 2013. So let's hop into what exactly my ECM comprises of. The microcontroller is a micro technology uh, PIC device. Um, the diagnostics protocol is a single wire, wire variable pulse month. Ugh variable pulse width, uh, J1850. And the CAM protocol is uh, 500 kilobyte, kilobits a second, 11 bit IDs, 20 ohm termination, and least significant bit first. When it came to hardware for my project, I started out with this Seed Studio device, but uh, after the second one failed me, I navigated over to using the uh, the Cannibal device, which was much more reliable. And software wise, I started off using the Seed Studio software, but uh, ended up converting over to Busmaster after I purchased the uh, Cannibal device. So after doing quite a few CAN capture sessions and uh, figuring out some of the CAN definitions from reading CAN packets directly from the bike, I was kind of over the idea of spending hours in the hot, hot garage uh, huffing exhaust fumes. So I thought, why not try some engine simulation? Um, the most important part for my bike when simulating the engine sensor data is the crankshaft sensor output, uh, the ECM, um, won't really acknowledge uh, some of the other data if the crankshaft sensor output uh, is not reading correctly. Um, on my bike, the crankshaft sensor uh, produces two waves, 180 degrees out of phase with each other. Uh, the wave is generated using a hall sensor and a stepped rotor tone ring um, surrounding the stator magneto. Uh, there are 34 steps and a timing gap, the equivalent to two wavelengths or two steps. So it's essentially 36 steps. And there we have a picture of it. And you can see the uh, timing gap there, pretty common. And uh, now let's take a look at it. And there we go, a few uh, oscilloscope uh, readings of the output so I know exactly what I'm recreating. And so how do we simulate it? There's 36 steps. One full step every 10 degrees, 360 degrees in a circle. Uh, we pick an RPM. For math's sake, we'll do 6,000 RPMs. Um, and then since we all know, RPM is a measurement of minutes and hertz is a measurement by seconds. We'll have a math equation that looks something like the following. RPM divided by 60 seconds times 36 steps. And we get a... Um, wavelength of 3.6 kilohertz to simulate the um, 6,000 RPMs. So the code, what we do is uh, we take the frequency input by the user through the serial monitor. I did all this uh, using a uh, Arduino Teensy and um, we uh, calculate the time to execute both a 34 wave cycle and a 36 wave cycle in microseconds. So um, we set our variables there, RPM time and RPM restart. And then uh, our code logic looks something like this. If the uh, wave start time is greater than RPM time, then we stop the wave and if wave start time greater than RPM restart, we restart the wave. So basically what's happening here is we produce a wave for 34 seconds. And then once the time hits greater than 34 seconds, we stop it. And then we turn it back on once the time hits greater than 36 seconds. So we have that, those 34 steps with a, um, uh, with a two-step pause. And now let's take a look at what we got. And there's our oscilloscope output. We got the 34 
steps and then the blank spot, the equivalent two steps. Now, we'll look into uh, doing the uh, mile per hour, the speed. Um, the speed sensor simulation is a bit more basic because there's no timing gap. So uh, simulate our speed sensor. Um, we um, will take a, a given frequency um, that was input by the user again through the uh, serial monitor. And we'll turn on and off one of the pins rapidly to uh, generate a square wave. So we first calculate the period uh, to complete one wave cycle in microseconds. And then uh, we divide that by two to uh, find out how long the pin needs to stay in each state to complete the entire waveform. And uh, we um, control it with a uh, non-blocking delay here. So you can see there if the delay timer is less than uh, the speed time divided by two, pin off. And if it's greater than pin on. And um, if it's greater than, and once we created two, um, which we cause uh, a, a full waveform there, then uh, we restart the timer and go to town again. So there we have it. And again, this code for the uh, um, Teensy can all be found in my um, GitHub repository that I uh, um, gave at the beginning of the talk. So now that we got our two waves looking good, we'll play with it a little bit. So aside from um, the speed and RPM, I also programmed in a few um, switches so that I could um, pop back and forth the things such as the neutral switch and um, the gas light and a few other things. So we'll watch it and give it a try here. So oil pressure, true. And you could see up there, sorry, I forgot to point it out, but the oil pressure light went there and now we'll change our neutral switch to false. Boom. And then uh, um, low fuel set to true. And um, one thing about the low fuel, um, as it says right here, it has to remain true for 20 seconds before the ECM flips the low fuel bit to true. So it'll pop on any second there. And there we go, low fuel, and you see the fuel trip flipped over there. And here's the fun part, RPM frequency 1001. And we got a little bit of RPM going there and speed frequency 300. And now we got a little bit of speed going there. And if you'll notice in a second, uh, the fuel trip odometer goes up to one, the end. So success. Oops. What the heck happened here? Okay, so um let me switch back into presentation mode. So I um once I did that I started capturing sessions like crazy. I was capturing everything to a CSV and, um, you know, clearly um, they, uh, you know, all this data in only one set of eyes, you know, you don't want to go through all that um, without some software analyzing it. So I created a Python script that compares two CSVs that were created using the CAN software. Um, in the example I'm about to show, um, I have two CSVs. One is where I set the oil pressure to true, and the second is where I set the oil pressure to uh, false. So, oops. So a little bit about uh, my, um, my 
parser here, my, uh, my Python script. Um, out of the 15 populated uh, columns used by my um, software, I, um, we only use nine of them. It's the frame ID and then the eight bytes. So, um, basically what the Python script does is it looks at the number of times each ID appears and the number of times a hex value appears in each given ID, and then compares that to allow us to have in our outputs uh, the difference in hex value appearances, the increase and decrease percentage of hex value appearances, and uh, appearance of a new hex value in a given ID. And I also programmed it to um, convert hex, uh, the hex value to binary. So if we take a look here, uh, this output shows the number of times a hex value appears in a given ID. If its appearance account was zero in either of the can capture session, the line will be highlighted in red. If the number of hex, um, so, uh, sorry, the line will be highlighted in red if the number of hex value appearances is equal to the number of appearances of its given ID. So, meaning that in one um, can capture session, the hex value appeared zero times, and in the other one, it appeared 100% of the time. So if we take a look here, we have that happen four times in this one. There is hex value 19 and 99, which appeared in ID 202 100% of the time while appearing in, uh, in one can capture session while appearing zero times in the other one. And then we have um, down here hex value 20 and hex value 60, which appeared in ID 451 100% of the time in one file and 0% of the time in the other. And um, I can confirm that uh, after, you know, figuring this out, I was able to verify that um, an ID 202 byte A bit seven is the low oil warning light and ID 451 byte H bit six is an oil pressure true false bit. Um, so we can see, so let's go on again, this, um, which we call it, uh, this, this Python script is available at my, um, uh, GitHub accounts to take a look at and analyze your own CSVs. And now we'll look now that I have the, um, now that I've reversed a whole bunch using the Python script and um, you know, I was able to trigger all types of ECM settings to reverse, I developed my first prototype here. This project was used with a, a um, I'll wait and let it go. All right, so um, that was developed using a Nexteon display and a um, ESP32 with uh, some, um, with a, um, a CAN input on it. And, um, you know, originally I was going to make this from the ground up, but um, 
I don't know. I just decided when everything's exposed to the elements, like on a motorcycle, it probably wasn't the, uh, the best route to go. So I ended up purchasing a, uh, an AIM MXS 1.2 Strata, um, which so far I've loved and highly recommend. I haven't actually put it on the bike yet, but uh, here's a little video of uh, what I got going. We're going to let the, uh, the bike warm up. Um, you'll see the uh, light over here um, for the engine temperature will go from blue to green um, when the engine is warm and then I'll, uh, I'll give it a few revs to show off. All right, there we go. So what's next for the project? Aside from finishing the development of the dash, you know, I'd really like to uh, stretch my Python script a little bit further. Uh, right now, all the IDs to my bike are hard programmed into the Python script. Ideally, you know, this Python script would be able to look at the ID column, grab all the individual IDs that are in it, and then start analyzing then. Um, you know, I spent a lot of time as a front-end developer, and um, I'd also like to make uh, the Python script output a little bit prettier. Um, I think some data visualization that I've started playing with, um, you know, would really spice things up a bit and kind of make things uh, easier to point out. Um, some byte annotation. Um, Right now, uh, the Python script only parses data based on the hex values and the IDs. So you could end up with some, uh, some confusion on, you know, if you're getting hex value changes in different bytes uh, in the same ID and stuff like that. And then uh, I also like to implement some bit flip search, which, you know, would help things with uh, like the ground triggers and or ground switches and stuff like that that um, are in the um, dash and stuff. So, you know, um, so anyways, um, that's about it. Um, you know, uh, I wanna give some shout outs and, and some thanks. Uh, thanks to the Buell community, there's, really nothing like it. Uh, thanks to the man, the myth, the legend himself, Eric Buell, and those involved with Buell Motorcycles and EBR. And, uh, you know, even though you guys probably hate me, I want to say thanks to Tim Blumenberg at IDS, who uh, is the company that developed the ECM, and uh, Bill Melvin, who currently owns EBR. Um, and then some of my uh, gearhead friends that uh, I wouldn't have been able to do this without uh, Jacob, Zach, Rob Weaver, Leyland. Um, you know, it couldn't have been done without everyone. Thanks.